Hey students, this is Mrs. Foy, and we're going to talk a little bit about the origin of species. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the difference between microevolution, um, which is going to be looking at basically the allele frequencies within a gene pool within a population, and macroevolution, which is going to look at um, changes um, over evolutionary big long periods of times with uh, with different organisms different species um, so I want to talk a little bit about just the definition of a species and the biological species concept the one that's most accepted there's lots of different definition of what a species is but the idea that you have um, members in a population that can interbreed in nature and produce viable fertile offspring um, and they don't breed successfully with other populations. So um, you've got to have gene flow between these populations that, that hold the, the phenotype together so that you have um, a, a species concept. But there's limitations of this biological species concept. For example, growler bears are hybrids of um, polar bears and grizzly bears whose um, Territory sometimes overlap. This is okay. unfortunately uh, a bear that was killed, um, but is an example of a, a polar bear grizzly bear hybrid that happened in in nature. And um, the offspring are viable, um, but their their different habitats uh, do not allow them to very often um, interbreed. And when they do, there's not a, a lot of gene flow that occurs between them. Um, we, we know that just looking morphologically at organisms, you can't necessarily tell if they're different species. So here we have two birds that are different species but look very similar. And then we have, we have a lot of variation um, within the human species within a single species. We see a lot of diversity. So because our definition of a species has so much to do with being able to reproduce and being able to produce viable fertile offspring, we're going to talk a little bit about reproductive isolation. Um, a hybrid we know is an offspring of a cross between two different individuals. And so there are, I'm showing you this big slide here, and I know it's too small for you to see, but it kind of gives you the big overall picture of these different types of reproductive barriers. So you can have Prezygotic barriers. So zygote, you know, is a fertilized egg. So these would be barriers that would prevent um, anything prezygote. So it's going to be any kind of barriers that prevent the zygote from from forming. And then we have postzygotic barriers, which are going to be types of um, barriers that prevent um, reproduction to be successful. Um, after the zygote. So this would be, yes, you have an offspring that's produced, but it's, it's not going to be um, very viable or fertile. So here are examples of prezygotic barriers. So for example, you can have habitat isolation. So if you have two different organisms that are in two different habitats, they're not going to come across each other, and therefore they're not going to mate. Um, you can have temporal isolation. So temporal means time. So you can have two different organisms that um, that that are active during different times. Some be might might be nocturnal. Others may be um, active during the day. So th that would be an example of temporal isolation. You can have behavioral isolation. So we talked um, earlier today about the example of um, you know different mating behaviors and um, different uh, you know you can have birds that. The male sings out um, when there is danger and others that are quiet when there's danger. So um, all of those are example of prezygotic barriers. Then you can have mechanical isolation. So you can have mating that is attempted, but um, because of the mechanics of where the gonads are, they don't match up. And so that would be mechanical isolation. You can't have fertilization. You can also have gametic isolation. So for example, it, with external fertilization, like what you would have in a lot of aquatic organisms like the sea urchins, you know, where you would have the male just spray the sperm into the um, water and the females release her eggs, there may be protein differences on the, um, or chemical differences on the male um, and the female gamete that don't allow them to um, 
to fertilize. Um, and so those would all be prezygotic barriers. So the next three barriers we're going to talk about are all post-fertilization. So fertilization did occur, but for example, in this uh, first example of a post-zygotic barrier, you would have reduced hybrid viability. So here you have an example of um, the offspring of, uh, of two different types of um, salamanders that they did produce a viable offspring, but it's reduced. So it's sickly, it doesn't live very long, and so that would be reduced hybrid vi vi uh, viability. Another example is reduced hybrid fertility. So we've talked about um, mating a horse with a donkey and getting a mule. Mules are very uh, vigorous, um, but unfortunately, in the great number of cases, they're not fertile. So they would be um, they would not pass our test for what is a species. And then you can have hybrid breakdown. So a lot of times what happens in plants is that you would have um, a hybrid that was very um, vigorous for the first couple of, uh, of uh, generations, and then you would have you know, reduced um, uh, viability. So you would, you would have these organisms that weren't very strong, they would succumb to disease, and that's hybrid breakdown. And sometimes you see that with plants. So this idea of biological species concept, um, that organisms are in the same species if they can reproduce and, and produce a, um, a viable fertile offspring, um, obviously that can't be applied to fossils because we don't know about that, and it can't be applied to asexual organisms, including all bacteria. So we do have other definitions of species. For example, we have morphological species concept where we would describe their morphology, what they look like. We have ecological species concept where we would describe what niche or role um, that an organism plays um, in a habitat. And we have phylogenetic where we look at the evolutionary relationships between different species. So speciation can take place in basically two major ways, with or without geographic separation. So uh, we call these allopatric speciation. Allo means other, patric means country, so allopatric literally means other country. And we can have sympatric speciation, which means same country. So the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation is whether or not there is a geographical divide between the populations. So you see in allopatric, there is a physical divide between these two populations that then become two different species. And in symp sympatric speciation, we don't have a, a geographical divide, but they do become separate species. So in allopatric speciation, you're going to have your gene flow that is either reduced or interrupted when the population is physically divided. Um, and the barrier depends on, um, you know, the ability of the population to disperse. So, for example, that could be a body of water. Obviously, that wouldn't work for aquatic organisms, but it could be mountains. It could be a river. Um, there's lots of different, um, of different types of barriers. And then the populations would be separated, and they would have natural selection and mutation and genetic drift, which would act on them to become two separate species. So this is an example of a small little chipmunk. There's actually two different species um, living on either side of the Grand Canyon. So obviously, that's a very big geographical divide. In sympatric speciation, the speciation is going to take place where the geographical um, areas are overlapping. Um, we see this happening, this type of speciation is happening a lot in plants. Um, and one of the reasons is that plants very often um, can have what we call polyploidy. So they are going to have extra sets of chromosomes due to accidents and cell division. And these are not usually um, connected with, with viable offspring um, in the animal kingdom, but they are in plants. Um, and autopolyploidy is where you have an individual with more than one two chromosome set derived from one species. So this would be something that would happen uh, naturally. So for example, you could have a failure of cell division after the chromosomes duplicate. Um, and so um, this would be, uh, this would give rise to a tetraploid cell. Then those gametes that are produced, instead of being 1N or 2N, and then you're going to have offspring with tetraploidy, which could be viable and fertile, again, 
um, much more common in plants. And a lot of our important food crops um, in, for humans are polyploid plants. So oat, wheat, cotton, potatoes, tobacco, and weeds, all of those are polyploid plants. But um, sympatric speciation can also um, result from the appearance of new ecological niches. So for example, um, you have these uh, maggot flies that can live on native hawthorn trees in North America, as well as more introduced apple trees. Most people think that apple trees are native, and they're actually not. They were introduced by settlers um, from Europe. So we have um, same geographical location, but we have two different types of species because of, uh, of flies based on the habitat that they live on in these trees. Sexual selection can also drive sympatric speciation. So we, we know um, from the video that we watched that that sexual selection, mate selection, mate choice can can also drive um, can also drive evolution, and uh, we see this um, with with peacocks, but we also see them in a certain type of fish called cichlid fish in Lake Victoria. So this was a very interesting um, uh, experiment. You can see all the different variations of these cichlid fish, and these are very often. Um, a very popular aquarium fish. So you may even have some of these if you have an aquarium. So some research were looking at the question, does sexual selection in cichlids result in reproductive isolation? So what they did was uh, normally these two different species of fish have, you, as you can see, have varied color patterns. And under normal light, the females would choose the color pattern based on the species. But when the researchers put a monochromatic orange light in the aquarium, the, um, the females could not choose um, their own species because the coloration was different. And so they did, en they did end up mating um, with, uh, with different species fish and producing viable offspring. So that was a, a, an interesting um, experiment. So just in review, you have allopatric speciation where you have a geographical isolation and um, reproductive isolation can then arise by natural selection um, happening in the two different um, separated areas, genetic drift or sexual selection. Um, and even if the contact is restored between the populations, interbreeding is, is prohibited. In sympatric speciation, you have a reproductive barrier um, that isolates two different populations without them being physically divided. Um, and those two populations then would, would, would um, uh, evolve into two different species by either an accident in cell division, like polyploidy, and as we said, that happens a lot with plants, or natural selection acting on those two different groups in different ways or in sexual selections, like we saw with the cichlids. So um, what happens if you have um, a speciation occur in, like, say, allopatric um, speciation, and then you have the two, two populations coming back in contact with one another? And we call this a hybrid zone, where you have organisms from different species that now come into contact with each other, and, and you may have possible hybrids being produced. So there's three different... Um, outcomes of this, uh, you can either have um, a reinforcement um, where, so because of the um, differences in reproduction, you would have these two different populations are going to continue to diverge, or you can have a fusion of these two hybrids in the hybrid zone where they would then um, go back to one species, or you could have stability where you would have some hybridization but not any uh, further divergent of the population. So about how long does it take to form new species? And how many genes change when one species, species um, splits into two? So these are, um, there's a lot of these uh, questions that we're still learning about. And two of the main theories um, about how long it takes for a species to come about are called punctuated equilibrium or punctuated evolution and a gradual pattern or, or uh, uh, gradualization. And this would be more of what Darwin had in mind, where you have species are going to diverge from each other, um, 
of, under very slow, methodical um, changes to their genes over a long period of time. But interestingly, um, sometimes you can have a sudden change in the environment or a sudden um, increase in the genetic variation, which would lead to a very, uh, a more quickly um, speciation event occurring. And we, and we call that punctuated um, equilibrium. And so even though we're talking about a relatively long period of time um, with both, the, with the punctuated, it's going to be a, um, a, uh, a, a more sudden change than with the gradual change in the species existence. So how long does these occur? Well, we can see that the punctuated pattern in the fossil record suggests that species speciation can be rapid. Um, it could be um, anywhere from 4,000 years that we see with some of the cichlid fish to um, a much, much longer case with some of uh, beetles and other organisms that we see, but an average of about 6 million years, 6.5 million years, which is very interesting. So one of the things that is just helping this area explode, of course, is the study of genomics and proteomics that is allowing organ uh, researchers to be able to look at the genes and the actual uh, molecular changes in two different organisms. And that is definitely changing um, what we know of speciation. So I hope you've learned something about, about um, speciations and the, and the process of speciation, and I'll see you in class.